I asked them this one question. It's a term that Pastor Rant uses all the time. What is your big, hairy, audacious goal? What is the thing that is out of reach that only God can reach, but you know that if you're faithful to God, that, that there is a possibility that you will reach that, right? What is your big, hairy, audacious goal for the year? For your work, but not only for your work, for your family? Have spouses, have you had conversations with each other about your plans for this year? What is in your reach? What can you do? But what are you trusting God to do? Have you, can I encourage each and every single one of you, if you haven't got a plan for this year that includes God, it's not too late. Include God in your plans. Place Him in, in the space where you can't reach to so say, God, only you can do that because we've got to have faith for the things hoped for that are not yet seen, yeah. right? We've got to have those things. That's one of the principles that we believe, that as Christians, we, we don't just rely on ourselves, but we rely on God day in, day out to do the immeasurably more that we are yet to imagine, right? And so I, can't, I just wanted to add that with you guys today. Get together with your spouse. Don't make plans by yourselves. If, if you're single, make plans. Have dreams. Have aspirations. If you're married, make plans. If you're married with kids, make plans in the holidays, right? Because that's the only time where you get rest. But I want to, I want to lean into uh, our, our series for the, for the month. It's Living Principles. Um, and these are all about principles that bring life. It's it's not principles that distract you and stop you from getting life, but it's principles for receiving life and giving life to others. Um, last week, we spoke about the covenant, but this week, I want to read out of Psalms 15 verse 4, and it says this. It says, Who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, will not be shaken. Remember, the, the beginning of that passage says, who will dwell in his holy temple? Who will dwell on the holy mountain? And then further on, it says, who, he who keeps an oath, when it hurts, does anybody like uh, keeping a promise when, when it hurts you? Right? It's a bit painful. It's a bit uncomfortable. Sometimes you say, hey, I, I know I said this, but I, I just can't. Anybody had those moments? Right? Even when it hurts, but does not change their mind, they will not be shaken. See, this isn't about necessarily only keeping promises, keeping what you say, but it's, it's about not being indecisive, not being double-minded. Has anybody experienced being indecisive before, right? Every day, every day, you, you deciding where you want to go in the traffic. That's why we have Google Maps. Who's been confronted with that restaurant menu that has too many options, Right? And when there's too many options, you only choose the same thing you've ever chosen. Because you don't want to engage with the too many options, even though there might be something tastier than the normal that you choose. We've been faced with those indecisive moments. Has, has any husband in the room been faced with that conversation with your wife when you step into the car and she's like, so where are we going today? I have because I fail to make plans sometimes. But it's a, it's a moment of indecision, even, even when you're in Cape Town, because there's so many great things to do in Cape Town. You can go to the ocean, even though it's too cold, man up, just go get in. There's the mountains. You know, there's the hiking routes. There is so many choices for you to take your kids. Anybody do that during the holidays, right? We maximized on Rush and Freedom Adventure Park and all of those places. But there's so many options, and when there's so many options, we tend to be indecisive. We're confronted with the big life-changing decisions that may or may not have caught you by surprise, and we've all been faced with making decisions about something we don't necessarily agree with, but it's kind of in the gray area of, I agree, but I don't agree, but it might be fine, but it might not be okay. And we, we're in those indecisive places. But can I... Can I lean into a passage of Scripture? We're going to go through quite a bit of Scripture this morning. But James has a lot to say about being indecisive. In fact, it's, it's the only book in the Bible that actually talks about being double-minded. It says, if anyone lacks, any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Anybody receive a word from God and like, but God, did you actually say that? 
You have one of those like Daniel moments, or sorry, the Gideon moments where you, you put the, the, the cotton outside your tent and you say, God, if it's going to be pink skies in the morning, I'll say yes. If it's blue, si- blue skies, it's a no kind of thing. But it says, it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person, listen to this, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Because if you're indecisive about one thing, you'll be indecisive about a lot of things. It's not just a once-off pattern, but it's a pattern that follows your life. A double-minded in the Greek is a word that sounds like this. Constance, help me here. Dipsichos, which means two souls, two agendas operating from two different sets of moralities and values in contradiction of one another. So literally, when you are indecisive, you are operating from two different agendas, two different value sets, two different souls, the old and the new, or whatever it might be. But it's not just being about being having two souls, but it's being unstable in that as well. The word unstable uh, is de- derived from the word akatastatos, which means unable to stand or unable to be set. So when we are un- when we are double-minded, we are unable to stand or to be set on one particular thing. But we will always be tossed, and we will always be pushed. We are not anchored to one particular conviction, but to multiple value sets. And when we aren't set, then others will direct us. Correct. See, the friction between the two personalities of the double-minded person creates an atmosphere of spiritual and emotional instability. They are never settled in their purpose, and ultimately, they never fulfill their destiny in God. Isn't that the worst nightmare you could ever have? That if you are not a decisive person towards the conviction that God has laid before you, will, you will never do anything significant for God. That's a scary thought for me. That if you don't lead your own life, you won't do anything significant for God. But why are we so double-minded? Has anybody ever thought about this? Why are you so, why do you get to that place of indecisiveness? Number one, could be fear of failure. Anybody have a fear of failure in the room? All the time, right? As a, as a, as a husband, I've got a fear of failure because I know I've got to provide for my wife and my decisions impact my wife. But as a father, my decisions impact my family. And so if I make the wrong choice, that wrong choice impacts my family. But thank God that I've got an incredibly smart wife. And that's why God brings us together. And that's why we make decisions together. Because in my lack of wisdom, God brings a wife to bring wisdom. And in her lack of place of indecisiveness, God brings me to tell her to choose mushrooms and feta on her pizza. Amen. But that's why we collaborate. Megan and I are in community with each other. We don't make decisions separate from each other, but we collaborate, we co-labor together to see the destiny of God for our marriage and for our lives fulfilled and the purpose reached, right? So we've got a general doubt doubt in ourselves, in our own personal abilities, but also if we have a fear of failure, that means we have a general doubt in God's ability. Number two, we have a fear of missing out. We are indecisive because we don't want to miss out on the things that we perceive to be exciting, that we perceive to be good, that we perceive to possibly have a positive impact on our finances. Whatever it might be, we have a fear of missing out. Has anybody encountered or experienced FOMO in their lives, right? Any extrovert in the room has a FOMO complex. Because while you're talking to someone, you'll be seeing someone else talking to someone else, and they sometimes look like they're having a lot more fun than you are in your current conversation. And so while you're talking to this person, your one eye is literally squinting in that direction. It's probably why I'm such a bad listener. We did a listening test a few years ago, and the conversation, what we had to do was, we had to sit alongside someone else, and for five minutes we had to listen to them narrate a story to us. And after five minutes, you had to narrate their story back to them. I think I got two out of ten. And Megan's nodding her head. We've got a 
a fear of missing out. So we've got a fear of failure. We've got a fear of missing out, but we've also got a fear of being hurt. Because sometimes we have to make choices that trigger traumas. Sometimes we've got to make decisions that, that trigger abuse from, from previous parts of our lives or previous places where people have let us down, where trust has been broke, broken, where promises have been betrayed, where you've lost a family member in that decision. And we've, we've facing those decisions because of hurt. We're facing those decisions in our finances because we risked it once, we can't risk it again. We're facing that decision with our family, and sometimes our family has hurt us, so we can't do that with them again. Sometimes a friend has let us down, and so we won't trust that friend again because they let us down once. We're indecisive because of our past traumas, because of our fear of missing out, and because of our fear of perceived failure. But God directs us and says, and I think this is a word for all of us today, God directs us and says, it's a time to settle. It's time to draw a line. It's time to stop standing on the fence. It's time to stop being lukewarm. It's time to stand. It's time to be secure in your convictions. It's time to stop lingering and take a step of faith, take a step of courage. Matthew 5 verse 37, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. It says, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Can I say that being indecisive is not godly? If you're still making a decision and you're waiting on God and you need God to give you a word, that's different from being indecisive. No, that's carrying faith. But even when God gives you the word and you can't make the decision, that's being indecisive. And that indecisiveness is not from God, it's from the devil. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So how do we settle? How do we stand? And if you guys can write down these four points, this is going to be really handy for you. How do we settle? How do we stand? We have to start by choosing a side. You have to choose Man United or you have to choose Man City. But you can't choose them both. You can't, you can't support Barcelona and you can't support Man United at the same time. It's two different football teams. At some point, they're going to meet up with each other. We've got to choose a side. But often choosing a side isn't led by making a, choose, uh, making a choice first, but it's led by having a vision first. And that's why I'm asking us this year to have a vision. Have faith for things in your life. Have a picture of the preferred future for the things that you are hoping for that God is yet to break through in. We've got to have that vision for our life because without that vision, we won't know what decisions to make. And if we're indecisive, then that vision won't be met. If we don't know what decisions to make, that vision won't be reached. Because without a vision, we will deviate and we will be tossed from side to side. We will be directed to other people's visions instead of God's vision. We've got to have God's vision in line for our lives. We've got to have God's vision in mind when we make decisions. When we are in that gray area, when that decision causes us to stand on a fence, we've got to say, how does this give God glory? What would Jesus do? I need to pray until something happens. If we're making decisions without God, that means we're not following God's vision. And if we're not making, following God's vision, then we're not following the values that God has for our lives. See, it's not just about vision, but it's about values. We need to choose his vision, and when we choose his vision, then we'll be, he will begin to change our values. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. For, for those of us that are saved, that have given our lives to Jesus, the old is gone, the new is here. But one of the biggest struggles that we have as Christians is letting hold of the old and embracing the new. We struggle because we possibly don't read our Bible enough. We, we possibly don't spend enough time with God and allow Him to shape our lives, allow Him to dictate our values, allow Him to lead us. We, we are far more comfortable leading our own lives. But as we lead our own lives, we lead in the flesh. We don't lead in His Spirit. And what God is asking us to do is stop being indecisive about whose side you're on. You're either on the side of your flesh or you're on the side of His Spirit. 
We can't live in the middle. Because if we live in the middle, you won't achieve anything for your life. You've got to choose a side. And can I say, choose the left or choose the right, but make a decision. We've got to choose a side. For those of you that haven't given your life to Jesus yet, and that's okay. God's taking you on a journey, but He wants you to make a decision. He wants you to choose a side. And when we choose a vision, when we choose a side, then we've got to make a choice. We can't sit on the fence. We can't linger. And David is one of these people that found himself sitting on the fence multiple times. We know the story about David. We know how he fell short. We know that in those moments he was meant to go out to battle. When he didn't go out to battle, he found himself committing adultery. He was sitting on the fence in that moment. But David says this. He says, one thing I ask, one thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord in the midst of his shortcomings, in the midst of his failings, in the midst of his struggles, in the midst of his trials, he chose to dwell in the presence of God always. Whether that meant rebuke, whether that meant correction, whether that meant affirmation, he always chose the presence of God because that's where he knew he would find good things for his life, the things that brought life and the things that didn't bring death. He knew the place where he would be encouraged. He knew the place where he would find strength. He knew the place where he would be empowered. And that was in the presence of God. Sometimes the hardest thing to choose, the hardest place to choose is the place where we know we're going to be corrected and rebuked. Because we all make mistakes. But can I say that getting rebuked about a lie today is far better than being found out about a lie in a year's time. Because that lie has found momentum. That lie has found traction. That lie isn't just impacting you, but it's impacting the people that you encounter. It's impacting your family. It's impacting your friends. Because a lie begets a lie. A lie has to be hidden by another lie. It has to be hidden by another lie. It has to be hidden by another lie. Rather face the correction now in His presence than face the consequences in the future. Don't allow your choices to gather momentum. One thing I ask, one thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord. Romans 7 verse 21 to 25, and this is Paul speaking. Paul the apostle, Paul the guy that took the Christian faith all the way to the ends of Europe. It says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But then Paul makes a final statement. He makes an absolute statement. He makes a statement of conviction and belief and faith. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acknowledging that he struggles with sin. Acknowledging that he is a thorn in his side, in his flesh. Acknowledging that he falls short. He chooses to place himself in the presence of his Father because he knows that's where he will be better. That he knows that as he spends time with God, that those mistakes will be fewer and far between. That the frequency that he makes the choices of those nature will become less and less and less. Because being in his presence more means being in our flesh less. Paul knew something. He knew that Jesus did not only overcome death, but he overcame the things that produced death inside of us, inside of our lives. And he chose that each and every single day. Number three, we've, we've got to not just choose a side, we've got to not just make a choice, but we've got to overcome our trauma. We've got to overcome our trauma. See, we can find ourselves victim to our trauma. We can find ourselves victim of that abuse. We can find ourselves victim of that mistrust. We can find ourselves victim of that offense or that hurt or that pain. We, we can find ourselves festering each and every single day, making a case in our minds why we shouldn't 
choose or overcome those things each and every single day because it's something that we become used to. We become used to thinking like that. We become used to reacting like that. We become used to processing in that manner with that device. But God doesn't want us to say the same, but he wants us to overcome. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors because of him in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take accountability for that ourselves. Many of us make the mistake and we say, and that's, that's not to say that Jesus can't do this. But if we've got mental health issues, we cry out to God, but we never go to a psychologist. We cry out to God, but we never take that medication. Have you ever thought that possibly God's miracle is in the psychologist. God's miracle is in the medication. Yes, we must cry out to God day after day after day. I've got a lifelong chronic condition. In my liver, it's a slow burner condition that at some point I'm going to have to face the consequences of my condition. And I'm believing for God to heal me, but it doesn't mean that I stop taking my medication. Because that's stewarding and taking responsibility for the things that are inside of me. For many of us, we have to take responsibility for our trauma. We've got to take responsibility for our hurts. Even if that person never apologizes, even if that person never comes and tries to earn their trust back, whatever it might be, we've got to take responsibility for it. We've got to find counsel for it. We've got to find the tools to overcome those things, to wake up with different thought processes, to, to wake up as a victor and not as a victim. We've got to take responsibility for those things. And it requires a choice. Romans 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? God is for us. Who can be against us? Number four. We can choose a side, we can make a choice, we can overcome our trauma, but we've got to be inquisitive. As Christians, we've got to be people that learn. We've got to be people that study. You can't just rely on me or your cell leader or your own supervisor to grow your faith. You've got to have your own relationship with God. You've got to have your own quiet times. You've got to have your own praise parties in your room. You've got to have your own faith goals. You can't just trust on me to give you a vision. You've got to have a vision for your life. You've got to lean into God and say, God, where are you taking me this year? What do you need me to change? What are my shortcomings? Where are the gaps that I have not seen? God, give me a word for this year. God, as I'm reading your word, as, as I'm allowing your word to read me and shape me, God, would you, would you bring to the surface the things that are causing me to shake and shiver? Amen. We've got to rely on God for those things. Not just, not just the pastor on the platform. It's one of the short failings of our faith is that Christians don't take responsibility for their own faith. They rely on someone else to grow their faith. We've got to be inquisitive. We've got to be learners. We've got to be researchers. James 4 verse 7 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Not submit yourself to the pastor. Submit yourself to God. Surrender your life to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Yes, there are specific moments in our lives when we need prayer. Man, we, the Bible says when you need prayer, come to the elders and the elders will sprinkle oil on your forehead and they will pray for you, pray for your deliverance. But that does not mean that we can't pray for that ourselves. Come near to God and He will come near to you. You have to make a choice to be inquisitive about who God is. If you don't know who God is, if you don't know how much He loves you, if you don't understand the character of God and what it means to teach, be taught, and obey God's commands, find out what God's commands are. Find out what the covenant of Jesus Christ means. Find out those things for yourself. Because can I, can I tell you, the best places where I've learned is not when I've been at a lecture, because I'm a terrible listener, but when I've gone to listen to God myself. That's when I've learned. That's when I've grown. That's when I've participated. When we have cell groups, that's where you participate. You don't just listen, but you add to the conversation. You add value and thoughts, even though it's a bad thought or even though it's a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. There are no stupid questions when it comes to Jesus. Find someone 
in your cell group to disciple you. Come to church more regularly. Can I say the tragedy about Christianity is that the average statistic is that a Christian attends church once every four weeks. That's not going to grow you in your faith. It's not going to grow you in your faith. You know, in the Bible times, people came to the synagogue each and every single day. And we struggle to come to church once a month. That's not going to grow your faith. Because more than likely, we got distracted in, the, in, in our week. We didn't have a quiet time with God. But Sunday comes and it's a place for ourselves to reorientate ourselves back. To say, God... I'm, re- I'm repenting for not doing what I said I would do during this week. Help me to do better this week. Help me to put better principles in place. Help me to live with living principles and not uh, principles that bring death. We've got to be inquisitive. Find someone to disciple you. Find a cell group to attend. Come to church more regularly. Come to prayer nights. Pray in your bedroom. Pray when you're washing dish- dishes. Pray when you're playing with your kids. Pray when you're having rest. Because when we give our lives to Jesus, when we give our lives, we are essentially, sorry, carry on that verse, I got on a tangent. It says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. We've constantly got to be washing our hands. That's, That's a place where we're reflecting on the quality of our own life. We're reflecting on the convictions of our heart. Because let's face it, when we give our lives to Jesus, we're essentially still double-minded. Because even though we have a new spirit living inside of us, we're still contending with the flesh that's attached. But as we are inquisitive, as we reach out to God, as we abide in Him, as we draw near to Him, our flesh will have, or our spirit will have more impact and more and more impact on our flesh. And we'll become more like Jesus. Do a Life Academy course. Join a cell. Ask a cell leader to disciple you. Place things in your life that produce stability. And do what Philippians 2 verse 12 says, work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. It's not let the pastor work out your salvation, it's you work out your salvation. But as we close, double-mindedness has a lot to do with our brokenness. Band, you guys can come up. Double-mindedness has a lot to do with our brokenness. And in Jeremiah... There's a great passage of Scripture in Jeremiah 18, verse 1 to 10. It says, God told Jeremiah, up on your feet, go to the potter's house. When you get there, I'll tell you what you have to say. So I went to the potter's house, and sure enough, the potter was there, working away at his wheel. Whenever the pot, pot, whenever the potter, whenever the pot the potter was working on turned out badly, as sometimes happens when you're working with clay, the potter would simply start over and use the same clay to make another pot. Then God's message came to me. Can't I do just as this potter does? People of Israel, God's decree, watch this potter. In the same way that this potter works his clay, I will work with you, O people of Israel. See, we're made of the same clay. But through our lives, we're shaped by two different entities, two different people, two different things. When we're born, we're born into a life of sin. We're not born into a life of salvation. And from that point, we are shaped by that sin, whatever it might look like. But Jesus says that I won't break you, but I will mold you. He will take exactly what you've been made of, the values, how you've been raised. He will draw all of the good things out of that. He will start over with the very same clay. And he will begin to reshape you and remake you into the thing that doesn't represent your sin, but represents his salvation. Our choice is what we choose that is going to shape us. What is our yes and what is our no? What we say yes to is a glorifying God, is allowing God to shape us more, or are we saying yes to other things? Are we saying no to things that aren't going to glorify God, that aren't going to produce life in us, but will repeat death? What are we doing? But David, in the midst of that, says, one thing I ask, one thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord for all of my days. Can I say that His presence changes everything? 
His presence will change your perspective. His presence will change your position. His presence will change your problems. But it requires His presence. In Psalms 15, it brings us to the beginning and says, Who can dwell in the sacred temple? Who can live on my holy mountain? Well, that was Old Testament. But there's a new covenant that came through Jesus. And that new covenant says this, that your sins are forgiven and you are invited back into community with God. See, the starting place for all of us is that we need to recognize that we're all sinners. That we are all broken. In some sort of way, we are all flawed. We are all broken. We are sinners that need salvation. Your marriage might not be perfect, but God will hold you together. Your parenting might not be 100%, but God will hold your family when you honor Him. Your finances might not be good, but God promised to supply every single one of your needs. But it requires us to recognize that we are sinners that need a Savior. It requires us to know who Jesus is. It requires us to know what He did. It requires us to know how much He loves us, how much He cares for us, and how much He dreams for us. But it requires us to recognize that we need Him in the first place. Because Jesus came. God incarnate came down to earth to encounter every sin and every shame, every struggle and every trial, every thought that does not honor God, Jesus encountered. He encountered every tribulation that we could ever experience. He encountered that. But He was never overcome by it. He overcame it. He was tortured. He was stripped of His pride. He was shamed. He was ridiculed. He hung on a cross. And yet He still said, Gee, oh God, my Father, forgive them, for they know, know not what they do. He gave His final breath on that cross. And He said, it is finished. Not his pain, not his torment, but our pain and our shame. It is finished for you and I. He came to rescue us. He came to redeem us. He came to restore us. He came to renew us. You will not be held by the enemy's weapons because you have overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. And that Lamb is Jesus Christ. And He didn't just die on the cross for our sins, but He rose again so that we could be shown how to rise up against our own death. And the decision is here for you today. Gabe, you can grab this. The decision is here for you today. That if you recognize that you are a sinner, that you recognize that you need to make a choice, that you have been standing on the fence for far too long. God has been speaking to you, but you're too scared to let this life go because you feel that this life is good. But can I tell you that decision will lead you to a life that is far better than the one that you think is nice. You will learn more about yourself. You will learn more about Him and you will learn more about the promises that He has for you but it means that you need to acknowledge that He gave His life for you because you were a sinner. And if you're here today and you haven't made that choice yet, you found yourself sitting on the fence just with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, don't look around in this moment. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, if you want to make that choice, you can just pray this simple prayer after me right now and you can say this after me, and we're going to say this together, you can just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And thank you that you rose again. Lord Jesus, I know I, that I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I know that I need salvation. So Jesus, today, I ask you to come and live in my heart. Forgive me of the things I've done wrong. But from this day, help me to do things that give you glory. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody who believes that says...